In this video, we're going to continue our look at the MITS Programming Package 2. This package allowed you to use the Altair as a development environment for 8080 assembly language programs. And it did it without requiring anything but paper tape or cassette tape as the mass storage device. Obviously, this was very important in days before the floppy disk was available for a micro. But even after the floppy disks were available, this program saw a continued use for a couple of reasons. One, floppy drives weren't cheap. They cost as much or more than your whole computer did, so not everybody could afford to go add a floppy drive to their micro, so this was still a great way to develop assembly language programs. Also, if you were sticking with software from MITS or Altair, uh, Altair DOS, which was intended to be the disk-based replacement for this package, didn't actually ship for about a year and a half after the Altair floppy drive was shipping with a working basic. So frankly, you didn't have much choice but to continue using this package if you were going to stick with Altair software. Alright, if you haven't watched the video prior to this one, I'd recommend it. In that video, we load the monitor portion of this uh, package using the exact same bootstrap procedure you'd use to load BASIC. Once the monitor was loaded, then we used the monitor itself to load the editor into memory and the assembler into memory. And that's what we see on the screen right now. The question mark is the prompt from the monitor. What we did is used a monitor command called open, OPN, that's a built-in command in the monitor, to assign the ABS device to AC. AC is the audio cassette. ABS is absolute device, excuse me, absolute files. What that means is that anytime the monitor wants to read or write or the assembler wants to write an absolute binary file for execution, it does it through the ABS device. We have now told that, um, we have told the computer to do that through the audio cassette. Without that command, it would have done it through the same serial port used for the console, which would be fine if we were doing teletype and paper tape, but we're using cassette. All right, we then type the command EDT. Well, that's actually not a command, and the uh, monitor then looks to see, well, is that already loaded in memory? Well, it wasn't loaded in memory. So at that point, it then goes to the ABS device to load the file EDT. We position the cassette properly, hit play, and gave the monitor what it wanted. It wanted the EDD file. It loaded it into memory and started it up. And what you're seeing here is the actual editor running. We typed E to exit the editor back to the monitor. Then we did the exact same thing with the assembler. The assembler we loaded is called AM2. It went out to cassette tape, we hit play at the right spot, loaded it into memory, and ran the assembler. We then typed EOA, that's end of assembly, that exits the assembler back to the monitor. So, at this point, we're ready to go. We have the monitor in memory, followed immediately by the editor in memory, followed immediately by the assembler. All three in there at once. And you'll see what an efficient organization this is, as long as we don't clobber any of that, because now we don't have to go back out to tape and le uh, load any files or save any files, or start programs for that matter. Alright, this occupies about the first 8K of the computer, a little bit less, so from the eight, second 8K boundary up, we can put our program and let it run. Alright, so let's go ahead and run the editor, and we'll uh, work on writing a program. So EDT, the monitor looks to see if it's a command. It's not. It looks to see if it's already in memory. It is. So it says, okay, let's go ahead and run the editor. This is the command prompt for the editor. The I, or input command, insert command, puts us into input mode. And we're going to type a simple program that will just write a message to the screen and then exit back to the monitor. And we'll write it directly through the UART itself. All right, so we'll do a org 20,000 octal. That is the start of the second 8K in memory. We'll define a start symbol as the very first statement in our program. It can be any word. It doesn't have to be the word start. I just chose start as a label. And we're going to load a, uh, the HL pointer to point to a string. We'll call it message. All right, now we're going to loop through all the characters in the message. The first thing we have to do is make sure the UART is ready to transmit. So we're going to do an in from the 2SIO port. And that's a 20 octal is the control port. So I don't want hex there, I want octal. Uh, rub out produces an underscore. So what you're seeing there is the deleted H and then the Q. Alright, I'll add that immediately with two. That isolates the transmit ready bit. And if it's zero, meaning it's not ready, I'll jump back to loop. Otherwise, we're ready to transmit the character. So let's get the character from memory. We'll do that with a move to the uh, accumulator from memory. That's coming in through the HL pointer. 
Now in order to detect the end of string, let's use a null terminated string. So if this happens to be zero, we're done. So we need to test for zero. Or an accumulator with itself is a non-destructive test for zero. If it is zero, jump of zero back to the monitor. MON is a predefined symbol in the assembler and it always goes back to the entry point of the monitor so the monitor regains control. Otherwise, we want to send the character out to the screen. So you do by doing an out to 21 octal that writes to the 6850 that's on the 2SIO board and will transmit the character. Then increment uh, our memory pointer and jump back to the loop. Alright, so that's pretty much the program. Now there's some pseudo ops at the end that the assembler is going to want to see. So let's put those in. Well, close enough. <laughs> the begin pseudo op is used to tell this, the assembler where execution begins. That can be handy when it wants to enter the program into the program execution table in the monitor or when saving a program absolute file that information is also in the header of that file. The end pseudo op tells the assembler that there's no more statements to follow and therefore it can complete looking for any unresolved references, that kind of thing. And in a lot of assemblers, this is where you'd actually specify the start address, but in this assembler you specify the name of the file. So this would be the name it wrote out if uh, you had it write an absolute executable file. This is also the name it sticks into the program table in the monitor if you chose to tell it to run uh, in memory. All right, and finally, the assembler wants to see an end of assembler. Otherwise, it generates an end of file and it's not quite as pretty. Control Z ends the input operation. We're back to the prompt now. P prints everything. So we can take a look. We load our pointer. We loop. Uh, jump of zero at the end of the string. Blah, 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 blah. Now, obviously, I've got a mistake here and that I haven't defined message. But I want to go ahead and allow that so that we can see how easy this is to edit. All right, I can type E to exit the assembler, and you can see I'm back at the prompt. It didn't ask me to save it or anything. The reason is because that's all still in the edit buffer, and I can go back in and edit that again. Um, eventually, you'd want to save it um, in case you crash the program or something. It's a little bit of a risk here, but it's a trade-off for time. All right, so now the next step would be run the assembler. Now, typically, if you run an assembler, you specify an input source file. Well, I don't have a file yet. This is just sitting in memory. So one little trick that it's allowed here is that you can assign the input file to come from the edit buffer. So we have yet to assign the, the file device at all. The open command assigns FIL, which is the device through which all source files are read and written. So the editor reads and writes through FIL, and the assembler reads through FIL. We're going to assign that to the edit buffer. That's what the EB is, and then you have to follow that with A to tell it it's a text or ASCII file. You would think that would be the default, and it kind of alludes to it being the default in the manual, but it isn't. You have to specify the A. So now when we have the assembler take its input from a file, it's going to take it from the edit buffer. So now we can start the assembler. Oops. AM2. So now we're in the assembler. The assembler actually will take and immediately assemble any opcodes, etc. you type in. Um, taking it from a file is optional, but we want to. So the command to do that is file, and you could then specify a name here if you wanted, at which point it's going to read the FIL device and specifically look for something that has the file name you specify. If you don't specify a file name, it just reads whatever comes in the file device. We've told it to take it from the edit buffer. All right, so the assembler is run. It's now telling us what undefined symbols we have. It says the message variable, which is the address of our message we want to print is undefined and that we knew and we're back at the editor I mean we're back at the monitor so now we can go edit say that was nice and quick um, now this next part is critical if you type EDT and hit return here it would empty the buffer and you'd have to start completely over you can specify command line parameters in parentheses R means re-edit or resume in which case it leaves the old buffer in there so if you look now You'll see it's still in memory. It's critical to do that. Uh, otherwise, you lose everything you've done. All right, we want to define our message string. Let's put it in after line 11. So you say insert 11, 
and that will open up our source file past line 11. And we're going to define message. And let's put in a leading carriage return. Whoops, let's say uh, define byte. Put in a leading carriage return in line feed. And then uh, we could do all this on one line, but I'm going to break it out. This program is working. Will be our text string. Whoops. And then finally, we'll trail it with a carriage return line feed. And then we have to null terminate it because our program looks for that. All right, Control Z ends the input mode. Now I can take a look. So what did we do? We defined a message that has a leading carriage return line feed, and then the bytes. This is this program is working. Carriage return line feed, and null terminator. That should do it. We can exit. We can now run the assembler AM2. Take it from file input. Now undefined symbol still shows up. That's like a heading, and it's saying there's nothing wrong. Hey, we're back at the monitor. This should be in memory. Um, so now we can run it by typing jump to the starting address, which is 20,000 octal. This program is working. All right, that was pretty simple. Um, I don't like the fact that I got one space there and no space there. So let's edit again. Edit. And you do the R for resume or re-edit. So let's go ahead and put an extra line feed at the end. You can say replace line 14. There's, there's commands to actually edit individual characters, but memory and all that gets kind of tough, so I just tend to retype a bunch. Care turn, line feed, line feed, then null. All right, so now we've got an extra line feed to make that symmetrical, it looks like. I can assemble until it's coming from file. Jump 20,000. And now I've got even spaces. All right, now rather than typing jump 20,000, I could actually tell the monitor to include this in its program type table, so I could just type the name of the program, much like you type the name of editor or assembler. So let's show you how to do that. Uh, let's change the program up one more time just to make sure we are really working with a new program. Let's change the message. I'll replace line 13. Say this is the new message. Control-Z exits the insert mode. So now you can see all we've done is say this is the new message. And I'll exit. All right, so now we'll assemble that. Take it from the file. So that's done. Now, this is a two-step operation. I have to now go back into the assembler and give it a run command. But we have to now use a command line parameter with the assembler. P means preserve all symbols. So instead of cleaning out the symbol table, it's going to preserve everything from what we just did. So now all of these program symbols are still in memory, including the fact that we called this test. So now I can type this command, run test. What this does is it puts this program name into the program table that the monitor uses, gives it that start address, and then runs the program. So I said run test, this is the message. But now I can run the program all I want by typing test. And if I don't change the start address, I can do this even after I edit it. So let's re-edit the file and we'll change the message so we can see that we did it. We'll replace line 13. Change this again. All right, so now I run the assembler take it from file, and now I can just run test. You see, we've got it again. So once you've entered it as a program and the um, monitor thinks it's there, you can run it by just typing test. All right, um, let's go back one more time and take a look. We like this program so much, it's now time to save it. We are gonna have to finally take some time and write it out to cassette in order to keep this. And you could also write the binary file out to cassette so that you could run it from the monitor. And then again, there's other situations where the program isn't going to run under the monitor. You were just using this to develop and it's going to run from a bootstrap loader or be combined with something else. But that we're going to do in the next video. This video was just to give you an idea of how quickly you can edit, assemble, edit, assemble, do minor debug, edit, assemble, uh, even without a floppy disk because it's all in memory and it accesses the programs and the source file very, very quickly. All right, so that does it for this video. 
Now the computer used in this video is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately duplicates the look and feel, the features, and the performance of a real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside, so you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer as you would run all these great old exercises from the past. Be sure to visit the folks at AltairClone.com to learn more about this great machine.